Well, hey, y'all, this afternoon, this is your buddy George Jones over here at the Bergen Gun Range with my next installment on, hey, I got this old used gun, let's grade it out. So the old used gun we got today is the Beretta Model F. That's this guy right here. Uh, the Beretta Model F is one of the standard, you know, 92s. It's Beretta 92. Uh, they got an F and a F and S and several different variations on on the standard Beretta that have some small feature that I don't even want to go into But basically it's a Beretta now previously. I I reviewed the uh, the S Which was a European police agency gun that had been imported in the United States the only technical difference between that gun and this gun is the uh, this gun it has the American style magazine release up here and the S has the European style which the button is down here and some of the magazines are actually some of the Beretta factory magazines are actually cut high and low so they'll accommodate uh, both styles of gun uh, this particular gun is a police trade-in now, let's talk about that for a minute. Police trade-in, how does that happen? Well, it's pretty simple. An agency has probably, let's say you have a 25-man agency. Okay, a rural sheriff's department, for instance. Average sheriff's department has between, every sheriff will have between 5 and 15 or 20 armed full-time working deputies depending on the amount of people he has in his county and the amount of activity he has. Uh, Jefferson County Sheriff's Department probably has 80 officers here in Kentucky. Uh, Fayette County probably has 80 officers. Uh, I'm in Mercer, I believe. I believe our sheriff here has 18 officers. Uh, and they're like that so it's necessary to come up with some way to arm all of these officers so in some rural areas officers carry their own firearms and certify with them just like they would if they were municipally owned guns some agencies it's a municipally owned thing so we'll talk about that so agencies decide to upgrade so if you're a huge metropolitan agency like well, let's say New York City where you have 7,000 officers of various stripes different guys you know and and, uh, and you have the, the New York Metropolitan Police Force probably has four or five thousand people or more I guess you know and then the, the county sheriff he'll have a bunch of guys and then they'll have a school authority police and then they'll have a Transit Authority Police and a Port Authority Police and an Airport Authority Police and, and so forth and they've got thousands of sidearms and thousands of shotguns and hundreds of submachine guns. After a while you have to upgrade. After a while those guns start to show their age. Now the city of New York they take theirs because they don't want their firearms to fall into the uh, uh, firearm supply stream of the general public, they'll cut theirs up. Basically, they'll take torch and cut them up, sell them for scrap, um, and along with all of their confiscated weapons. Uh, law enforcement agencies that don't have a huge budget, they have to trade up. That's the way they have to do it, because here you take a gun that's worth several hundred dollars, you know, and you've got 20 of them you need to get rid of, that's several thousand dollars, you know, and they can use that monetary investment toward the purchase of new firearms. So Apache Armaments and several different companies around the country wind up with uh, police surplus firearms. So this is a police surplus firearm, let's get to grading it. Now, this gun, you could tell without even having any other indication that it was a police service handgun. Why? <laughs> it's pretty easy. 
The left hand grip is nice and checkered and is in good condition. The right hand grip is beat all to Sunday, uh, where that gun continually bangs against everything that the officer comes in contact with on his right hip. Uh, the back strap is very worn and, and, and beat up looking. Uh, the throat of the magazine well is in very beat up condition. The lanyard ring is polished off or beat off shiny, you know. And it has the ubiquitous agency marking engraved on it professionally, as well as the agency's number, okay? The agency's inventory number, this is 0165. And it has a lot of surface wear on it and so forth. It's fairly beat up, okay? Um, so that really affects it. So you go down there and this gun is not worth $450, okay? You go down there and this guy's at a gun show or it's at somewhere, it ain't worth $450. I'll just tell you right now. Um, it's got an agency marking on it up here, which some people might find that attractive. It's got the agency's inventory number marked on it, and it's got a lot of holster wear and a lot of banging wear on it. Uh, I don't know how this gun works. We're fixing to shoot it right here and find out how it works. But, um, you know, I think it probably works pretty good. But it is fairly worn and used. I think there's eight rounds in this magazine. I've got a standard bullseye style target sitting up down there at uh, 10 yards. And we're going to look at this gun and see how it actually shoots. Throw it off safety right there. Get back here a little bit. And uh, aim that guy down range and see how it actually shoot it takes. I'll just cock it the first time. Make it a little easier on everybody. Include me. Well, it's either me or that gun don't shoot good. Let's go out and take a look at it. Well, there's why the rear side ain't centered. That's why the rear side ain't centered. Should have noticed that before. It does have a fairly nice group. Right around there, right all around there, but uh, it's not uh, it's not zeroed very well. Camera back in its holder. I just noticed that. The rear side is about a 64th of an inch off center to the left. So, you know, I'm not going to peck around on this gun out in the field, but uh, yeah, it's about a 64th of an inch. It's almost out of the dovetail over here. Hmm. But it does shoot to the same point of impact every time, which means you know, it has the potential to work correctly. So, you know, uh, departments get a hold of them and they have to mark them a certain way and, and they have to use them in a certain way and, and that, that shows a certain amount of inherent wear on the gun being used and carried every day in an outside the pants holster and safety holster and so forth. So you wind up with certain wear patterns on the gun. Uh, and, you know, if you start, the more you take off of the original finish of a firearm, the less it's worth. Uh, the more you put on a firearm that's permanent, 
and not original inherent to its design, uh, the more you take away from the value of a firearm. Uh, this gun's a good gun, it works good, shoots, meh, well at least it shoots the same point of impact every time, uh, and can be corrected. Uh, that's a Beretta, an American made Beretta, and um, I'd, I'd give the value of this gun somewhere around $300. You know, it is a Beretta and it does work right. Uh, it's a little beat up. It's, you know, it'll make a good beater gun, boat gun, truck gun, whatever. But when you go to buy one of these guys, you have to think it says police trade in. Uh, will you see it advertised on the internet or so forth? Newly arrived, police trade-in, blah, blah, blahs. If it says police trade-in, that's Latin for beat all to pieces, buddy. That's, that's all there is to it. It's like buying a used police car. It may look nice on the outside, but when you get under the hood and you get in there and sit in that thing and the seat's all broke down and the steering column's all floppity, you know, and it's got oil dripping out of it, you know, police trade-in, that's a Latin phrase. It means <laughs> in bad shape. Uh, so just buy or beware. That's what this video is all about. Grading out a used gun, police trade in and so forth. And uh, like that. Well, all right then. That's about all I can drone on about. Uh, like, take, share, pie, commentate, subscribe. Leave me no dollar in the Patreon bucket if you want to. And if you don't want to, I'll keep right on making content for you. Uh, join the NRA. Uh, there's a lot going on in terms of gun control in the country right now, and you don't hear much out of the NRA. I think they're just waiting to see what actually comes down the pike. You know, don't start howling until you got something to howl about. A lot of these, a lot of these bills and so forth are being withdrawn and resubmitted. And, you know, there's things going on over in the state of Virginia. They're, they're kind of. Uh, digging themselves into a hole that they can't get out of. Uh, they're digging themselves into a hole that uh, constitutionally it won't pass muster, and it sure as shooting won't pass the Supreme Court. So they'll be tied up in court for years, and after those slags are voted out, <laughs> they'll still be in court. <laughs> I mean, you know, so don't get upset, and, you know, this is just a, a legal process that needs to take its course. Uh, I think all of the elected officials that are behind this in uh, Virginia will eventually get an electoral spanking. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of stuff on our side. We've got the Heller decision and several other Supreme Court decisions that... Uh, that were made by supposedly a liberal court for the simple reason that it wouldn't pass constitutional muster. Uh, so, you know, don't get upset and start howling and thinking, you know, they're going to do this and they're going to do that and they're going to do the other thing. And they might actually accomplish something that they want to get accomplished. But after all said and done, you know, it's not as big a deal as they think it's going to be. Well, all right, then. That's my little rant on uh, that for a while. Just uh, be safe and take care of your own house and do the best you can. We'll see y'all.